All right, it's just us now. Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, February 18th, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. People are different places, but wherever you're coming from, welcome. This will be broadcast on Zoom, as well as my personal Facebook page. That's another story. If you can find me on there, that's great. And you can watch on Facebook at your leisure. Uh, if you do have any comments or questions, we welcome those. We just ask you to type those in the comments, and I'm watching those, and I'll interject those in the discussion as we go along. This is the third or fourth installment, rather, of this series I put together called One Lesson. And let me explain that. It's, uh, I asked the, the guest speakers, today is Hugh DeLong of uh, somewhere in Texas. Hugh, forgive me. What city are you in? San Angelo. San Angelo, everybody's favorite spot in Texas. Very good. He's in San Angelo, Texas. Hugh, uh, anyway, Hugh is with us today, and I've asked our speakers to give us one lesson. One lesson you would like to give to a potential convert. There is not one lesson that's going to save the world. As we've mentioned before, Jesus had multiple lessons, so did Paul, and so should we. Depends on your audience. And I've seen the challenge so far of my guest speakers is, well, who is my audience? Well, you pick your audience and I'll do my best to keep the discussion going. The target audience of this Zoom is really Christians who want to learn how to be more effective in their teaching, ways that they can present the gospel to their neighbors and their friends, loved ones, and even their enemies. Don't count those out either. So we've had some good lessons, and I know today Hugh has uh, he's given me his outline. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. And if you don't know, Hugh and I go way back. I was a young, young man one time in my life back in 99 to 2001, and I somehow found myself moving to Tucson, Arizona with a great country club road, Church of Christ, and Hugh was uh, running a preacher training program, and I was the fourth one that they put through that program, and I just, uh, I've leaned on that experience in my last 20 plus years of preaching. Not only that, but Hugh and I have kept in constant touch I lean on him for a lot of things, so appreciate the work that he does. Really happy to have him here and giving this. So before uh, we get started, Hugh, I'm going to utter a word of prayer, and then I'll let you take over. Good. So let's have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, it's so good that we can be here today. We thank you so much again for this opportunity for us to come together on the internet and to study your word. We ask you give us wisdom now as we look into your words so we can have insights into how to maybe possibly present your word in a clearer succinct and understanding way. We pray that our motives are always to speak the truth in a spirit of love. And again, we pray for our efforts here and for everybody listening. It's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, Hugh, I'm gonna let you take over there and I'll be your target audience. Feel free to throw those curveball questions like you always did before. So. Uh, no curveball, just curveball on the whole lesson today. Sounds good. Um, rather than just giving one lesson and walking through it, I'm going to just back up. I'm the old man on this show today. So a little bit of history. How do you learn to do personal work? And my first experience was when I was converted. Uh, older preacher by the name of Clyde Goff. He passed away a year or two ago. But he came over to my house. My wife arranged that. She was a Christian and I wasn't. And he sat down at my kitchen table and looked at me and said, what do you think? And I began explaining a few things, and he listened patiently. Eventually, he had me turn over and read Mark chapter 16. And after I read, he said, now, what did Jesus say that you need to do to be saved? So I said, well, he said, you need to believe and be baptized. But, and I explained to him why you don't have to be baptized. And he looked at me and he says, interesting. But what did Jesus say? So I told him again, he that believes and baptized shall be saved, but, and I explained it over to him why you don't have to do that. Believe it or not, he was really slow because he just kept asking the same question. And we must have done that four or five times. And I'm thinking, he doesn't get it. And finally, it dawned on me what Jesus said was. <laughs> and 
So it was that night or the next Thursday night that I was baptized. But I learned something from that. He didn't argue with me. He simply kept pointing me to the scripture, which is much better than arguing, much better than trying to explain the Greek or trying to, uh, what did it say? Mm -hmm. And I appreciated that. So a few weeks later, he invited me to go with him as he was going to go talk to somebody else. And as we were driving up, he told me, he says, now, you're here only to observe, not to comment. And I said, okay. So we went in and Clyde did the same thing. Basically asked the man, what do you think? And the guy started talking. And I didn't know anything at that point in my life, but I could have answered most of what the man said. They were just wrong. Mm -hmm. And Clyde just sat there and smiled, said, oh, and the guy talked and talked. And after an hour, we picked up our things and went out into the car. And I told Clyde, I said, you didn't answer all of that stuff. I could have answered that. Why didn't you correct him? And Clyde smiled and said, he wasn't done talking yet. And we did that for another week or two. Mm -hmm. And at the end of about the third time that we met with this guy, Clyde knew everything that that guy believed and knew exactly where to start. And so that's one of the problems when you talk about a, a one lesson, and that's why all of us have done the same thing. Mm -hmm. Who is my audience? And what I've learned from Clyde and from experience is the only way you learn the audience of the particular person you're talking with is you gotta listen. And the more you listen, the more you're prepared to do that. So. One of the things that I, I did, one time I, I had a study with a guy in instrumental music. He had confronted me about it. And so we sat down and after about two weeks of my explaining all of this stuff to him, he shrugged his shoulders and he said, oh, I see your point, but it doesn't matter. I don't believe in God anyway. Wow. So let me show a chart that I've... Uh, done. And this is what I normally do is just a little pyramid. Mm -hmm. And as I get to know somebody, I need to know what step of this pyramid are they on. So with this particular man, we were clear up there on how to live and how to worship. And he was cleared down off of the chart. So I try in my talking with people to do a lot of listening, let them talk and figure out what do we actually have in common? Where can I begin building on this building block? And that's not an always an easy thing, but it, it, it's far better to begin that way. So that's what I see the apostles doing. Paul's preaching in the synagogue in Thessalonica, totally different than in Acts 17 with the uh, philosophers. So one particular lesson, I don't know, but I've watched now, I started this clear back 1971 and you were how old? Yeah, just, yeah, one years old at the time. Yeah, yes. okay. Rub You're the in. old guy, as you said. So what happened is, is as I begin doing this, I, at that point in history, most of the people that I talked with did believe in the Bible. Many of them already believed in uh, Jesus. Uh, so it was a matter of more like with Apollos, trying to teach them more accurately the way of truth. So I developed another uh, approach that I used with them. And I'm gonna switch to another chart at this okay. point. Uh, and that chart was just take a sheet of paper and draw a big square right in the middle of the sheet of paper and explain to them from 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is inspired of God. And therefore, everything that we teach, we need to show a scripture for. And if I could get them to agree with this, then the rest of the study was easy. 
because every time that you would say something, you just write it down in the box. If you have a scripture, just put the scripture there. Mm -hmm. I remember one time a young man, and very easily to agree with this, but he had a lot of opinions. And so he threw out something, well, I think that it'd be all right to do this. And I smiled and said, and what scripture am I going to write down here? He said, well, I don't have one. So I wrote it over in the margin where the opinion was. And we did that about four times. And every time he made a statement like that, I just asked the same question. I learned from old Clyde Goff on that. Right, right. And about the fourth time, I started to ask the question and he started laughing and he says, no, I don't have a scripture on it. Put it out in the uh, box. But what it did was we didn't argue about what the Bible teaches at that point. And he just had to admit. Mm -hmm. So I used that over and over and over and over and over again. And basically, once you've done that, back in those days, I could just flat say, so we can talk about anything you want to. But if we're going to talk about what the Bible teaches, then we're going to agree to simply put the scripture in the box and talk about how it, it teaches that. Mm -hmm. And I found that that eliminated a lot of the controversy that I uh, had with people. But times have changed. And so people have changed. Uh, more and more and more, I talk with people that really don't know much about the Bible. So I developed a different approach, and I used this one for probably 10 years or so, and that was a study of um, the Great Commission. It's almost everybody that thinks that they are a Christian today talks about the Great Commission, and they all know that uh, on that. So just made a chart for this, and again, the chart's a very simple chart. And I print it up blank and read through the scripture. When you read Matthew, then you begin putting in the little check marks. He mentioned preaching and he mentioned uh, uh, baptizing or making disciples. And leave the others blank. And then go to uh, Mark and then go to Luke. And what you find out once you've filled in the blanks on that, there's a lot of empty spaces. And not any one of the three uh, Great Commission scriptures give you all of the information that you need. And then just put them all together down at the bottom, everything that has a, a blank in it. That would be the approach of taking everything that the Bible says, as opposed to just taking Matthew's account or just taking Mark's account. Mm -hmm. And then just challenging them. Would you like to see how the apostles did it? What did they do with all three of these commissions? And then just start in on all of the conversion in the book of Acts. And again, I make a point of leaving the blank squares blank. If they didn't say it, don't put it in the square. And when you get done, what you begin seeing is that there's blank spots all over the piece of paper. But the two that are the most consistent is the preaching and the baptizing. Uh, just an amazing thing. And the, the advantage of that is they've read it. Because I always have them read the scripture. I don't read it to them or quote it. And they've read it. And I've asked them, now, what did you see? And so they're the ones that said, well, he preached and, and says they were baptized. So they basically filled out the chart. And if you mark it in great big X's so that they can see that. I had one man, and when we got done, he says, you know, it sure looks to me like baptism would be important, but I know it's not. And I just smiled, and I said, well, I'm going to stick with the scriptures. Uh, but he'd already seen the point mm -hmm. and making the point is really what you're trying to do on that. So what do you do today? Uh, Can I stop you right there for a minute before you get to what do we do today? 
talk to me about the patience this takes because you know i like the history here you're not going to argue you're just going to show them the simplicity of the scripture you started off with your great confession of when you started with this and a couple of weeks into your conversion hey dummy golf don't you know better <laughs> hey, i'm the guy i would have done it differently but then you realize there's a method to the madness here yeah that's great. Speak to me a little bit about maybe how hard that is sometimes because, hey, you're the hired gun. You're the preacher there. And you may do this in front of an audience and people are thinking, Hugh, you have to know this answer. What's wrong with you? Have you do you have a brain fart here? What's going on? Don't you have any are you gonna lose credibility here or do you have to just say, guys, pull them aside? Look, there's a method to my madness here. Please just let me do my thing. You have faith in God. Have faith in what I'm doing here. Is there a challenge there with that? Um most of my personal work, there's nobody but me there and whoever I'm talking to. Okay. Now, sometimes I'm talking to a family or to a group uh, with some of you student preachers that I took <laughs> along with me. I did what Clyde did. I just yeah. explained to him. Now, we're going to go in and we're going to figure out where they are. So we're going to listen mm -hmm. and make them promise. No talking, no arguing. You're just going to listen. Right. And, Observe. Right. Yeah. I, I think of times when I've had a Bible class at the building Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and you get visitors, you get questions, and I've had to kind of play this role. And I can tell people are looking at me like, boy, Jeff, we're paying you a pretty good salary to know the answer to these questions. And I'm doing, and I've had to pull people aside and say, wait a second, you got to see what I was doing there. I was listening, kind of what you're engaging, maybe not as much as I should have, and I got to keep the class going and keep things decently and orderly, but yeah, yeah, you want to lament how bad things are? Okay, give you five minutes to do that. And I agree, things are bad. Maybe God allows that to say, here's the gospel. But anyway, in front of an audience, that can be a challenge sometimes. I haven't had that much public while teaching in uh, uh, public. A little bit of that. Uh, the answer I usually would give on that is, I know you have more questions on that. Would you care to talk with me later? Sure. And just just bypass that. Now, one guy I finally had to just say, uh, this is my class and I'm going to teach it. And that's not part of what I came to talk about. Right. Uh, I had one guy get up and walk out. Uh, we've all had those experiences. Yeah. Uh, so the, the overall point is good, though. The overall point is what's effective. What, we, what are we trying to accomplish here? Reach the let the gospel reach somebody's heart. And yeah. this is what it takes. And that's the objective. If we can remember that, that's we're on pace. And that's what you're doing in this lesson. And yeah. I appreciate that. I, when I tried to convert my dad, uh, he was a very devout uh, Baptist deacon at that point in his life. And so he was also a plumbing contractor. And I'd periodically have to go to work with him. And we get in the truck together to spend all day together. And he's going to talk about religion. And we had some arguments <laughs> and I wasn't very good at this at that point in time. And I would argue and I would try to finesse the argument and try to explain and we got nowhere. And so finally, after we had gotten so angry at each other, we didn't talk to each other for weeks and weeks. I told uh, my wife, Sharon, that I can't do that anymore. And so the next time he asked me a question, I looked at him and said, well, Paul said, and I quoted a scripture. And I just smiled. And what happened was we kept changing uh, topics over the next few years. What I learned, he was listening. Mm -hmm. And so he would then go home and look up that scripture and read it and try to prove that I was wrong mm -hmm. uh, to his own mind. Mm -hmm. And it took four years. Uh, so it wasn't a one-time study, right. uh, but it was the same approach. Right. And the approach that I've learned is, let the scriptures do the arguing. Let the scriptures make your point. Mm -hmm. The hard part on that, Jeff, make sure you pick the right scripture. <laughs> pick Pick a scripture that deals specifically and directly with the, the question or the problem. I guess this is why so many brethren I run into are afraid. I may not know the right scripture. I think a lot of people would agree with this because if you just quote scripture, the argument is between them and the word of God. And yep. you can remove yep. yourself and you're just the instrument. 
And I think you're a wise teacher would set it, set it up that way. You're not arguing with me. We're not having an argument against each other, but what I think versus what you think is right. All yeah. I'm doing is quoting scripture, but maybe this is the fear that a lot of brethren have. They just don't know their scripture well enough. Well, Hugh, when do you get to the point when you know all the scripture as well as you should know? I don't know if you ever get to that point. I'm so, still struggling with that. Exactly. It just takes time. So go out there and try it. Well, one of the answers to that, Jeff, is you will come across these questions all the time. In fact, you'll probably sit trying to anticipate what they're going to ask. You'll make up a whole bunch of questions. Right. 95% of the time, they never ask any of those questions that you made up. Mm -hmm. So when I was working in uh, Los Angeles, uh, we had two sisters there. And on Monday mornings, they would go up and down the streets of, of Torrance, one of the subdivisions there of Los Angeles. And they'd knock on doors and they would hand the people a bulletin or whatever we had. And they said, well, our preacher likes to answer questions. Do you have any questions that our preacher could come and talk to you about? Nice. And I told them, I said, that'll never work. And they brought me five or six names and said they <laughs> want to talk to me. And they did this every week. I mean, literally, I was having two and three Bible studies a day back then, and just primarily from these two ladies, mm -hmm. and you had no idea what you're going to walk into. So I sat down and typed up my own little answer notebook. Now, I could have grabbed Nichols Pocket Encyclopedia, you know, or any one of, there's five or six of these that are designed for personal work that have the answers to all these questions. But when you start pulling that out, people take one look at that and you're not using the Bible anymore. Mm -hmm. So I made my own notebook and I typed it up. And sometimes they would ask a question. I said, you know, I was studying that the other day and I wrote down some notes on that. Can I share that with you? And you open up your own notebook and that, and I've never had anybody object. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's your notebook it's your now you may have just copied what cr nickel put in his little book but this gave me the confidence but i can also tell you i don't think that i used it more than a handful of times mm -hmm. uh, the questions don't get asked mm -hmm. uh, but it gave me the confidence right to simply walk in and sit down and say do you have any questions and let them begin talking. It took some while, uh, and I still take it with me. It underscores, <laughs> yeah, no, it's a great, great idea. And I think I've seen some of your notes and that you've shared with me some of those, which is great. But it underscores the point that each one of us has to just pray and study regularly and attend and pay attention. And this takes some work, but it does take some work, but it's worth it. But that's what being a Christian is. This is what you signed up for. It's going to take some work. You have to shut the screens off and shut off the hobbies a little bit and maybe pay a little more attention to these things. 30 minutes a day reading, you have time for that, but we feel like we don't. It would make a difference in how you approach these things. Yeah. Um, I've mentioned to you in our private conversations, a man by the name of Greg Kukul, K-O-U-K-L. I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, mm -hmm. but he made a statement in his, his book called Tactics. He doesn't try to do a one-time lesson that ends up in a conversion. He said he tries to put a rock in their shoe. Mm -hmm. Just one point to make them have to stop and think. One point that they have to go look it up in the book. One point that they have to, to contemplate about. And the next time that he talks with them, he can put another rock in their shoe. And I found that that is really the, the way that most people uh, get converted. Interesting story about Andy. Andy did a great job on your show, by the way. Andy uh, Cantrell a couple of weeks yeah. ago, right? Yes. Now, made me feel really bad because Andy was just a kid. I mean, probably two or three years old. His dad was a deacon where I was doing my student preaching. Interesting. And uh, one morning, uh, I was studying with Wayne Timmons, the older preacher there, and Frank knocked on the door and said, 
I have a fellow that needs to be baptized. And we looked and behind him was one of the workers for San Diego Gas and Electric. He had on an old ratty t-shirt, some jeans that had not been washed in three or four weeks, uh, beard, long scraggly hair. And so we took him in and Frank baptized him. And then they went, left and went back to work. And Wayne and I laughed and talked about that and said, well, that got the water dirty, but that's about all that accomplished. And next Sunday, this fellow showed up at church and he had on a clean t-shirt and some clean jeans. Gradually, he kept going and going, became one of my best friends, became an elder in the church. Uh, great, great disciple, good mm -hmm. man. And the way that worked was he and Frank got assigned to the same truck uh, with San Diego Gas and Electric. And Frank just talked with him day in, day out. Frank would take his lunch break and read the Bible. Uh, so it wasn't a one-time lesson per se, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was just this, and, and he had advantage. The guy couldn't get out of the truck. Mm -hmm. uh, couldn't get away from it. You're stuck. You're yeah. stuck. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that that's probably what he felt like, you know. But, right. <laughs> but it worked. Right. Uh, and so we we always look for all of these great opportunities somewhere else. And the answer is just talk to the people you know. Yeah. Talk to the people that you're already friends with. Right. Drop drop a, a rock in their shoe about some point, uh, even just mentioning, man, I heard a really great lesson the other day uh, and just begin talking about what uh, the lesson you heard. Mm -hmm. Another experience there in El Cajon, there was a fellow that was uh, mentally challenged. I don't know exactly how to put that diplomatically anymore in today's society. And uh, he walked in one morning and, and told us, he said, could uh, you guys come over and have a Bible study? Uh, a friend of mine wants to talk about it. And we went over and talked. And, and what this was doing, the guy simply told his friend, says, we're studying the book of Genesis. It's really interesting. Would you like to study with us? And I, I kid you not, by the end of the year, he had set up six or seven different studies with different people. And we ended up baptizing about half of them. And he couldn't teach a Bible class. If he, he just didn't have the ability. But he had the ability to say, it's a great class. Why don't you come and join us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's been my experience. Now, uh, Scott and Andy were talking about talking with people and, and how you get those conversations started. And how do you meet people at Starbucks or at uh, the swap meet. To be quite honest, I've never had to do that. Uh, those two ladies in uh, Los Angeles, they set up all of my studies. Mm -hmm. Then I moved to Tucson and you met Leo Austin. Yes. And Leo never met a stranger. And he became my guy. And every visitor that we had, Leo would talk with them and then ask them if they would like to study with us. And so, I mean, back in those days, there at Country Club Road, we had a lot of visitors, winter visitors, snowbirds, anything to get out of Ohio in December. And if they walked through the dorm, we had a lot of visitors. Leo would try to set up a study. And so we, I've been able to stay busy doing the teaching, but I'm not very good at going out and just getting mm -hmm. the studies. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a place in the church on evangelism for a lot of different things that people can do. Um, Leo wasn't very good at teaching studies, but he was excellent at arranging the study mm -hmm. to get it set up. Mm -hmm. And uh, we need all of those different people in the church. Mm -hmm. Now, things all changed when uh, Wilson Copeland 
one time, 2005, uh, I met him for the first time and we had lunch and he says, I'm going to China, why don't you come with me? And I went, okay. He said, really? And I said, when are you leaving? He said, you know, October, and this was like August. Well, I already had my passport, so I got everything arranged and went with him. And I'm going to tell you, it was a whole different prospect mm -hmm. because they didn't, they'd never seen a Bible. Most mm -hmm. of the people we talked with, they knew Jesus only from Christmas mm -hmm. and that only from the American version they saw on TV that they watched. So we had a whole different prospect there because you can't, you can't do my little thing uh, building the pyramid in one sense. Mm -hmm. And what I found there was we, and I don't know who the guy that put this together, but I modified it. And, and it was a, what we call the Chinese language study. Mm -hmm. And it was just showing that from the Chinese language, they, uh, some of the words and some of the signs that they use actually uh, were from the stories in the first six chapters of Genesis. Mm -hmm. And we use that to this day. I've read four or five books on that uh, by linguists, and some of the material was pretty much accurate. Some of it a little iffy, uh, to be quite honest. And so we would always just say, you know, there's some questions about this, but all we tried to do was to get them interested in reading the Bible for themselves. And if they thought it talked about the Chinese culture in the beginning, then they were always more ready to do it. But then we always found out what Andy was talking about, um, doing an overview of the Bible. But we had to step back from where Andy did. Uh, and just talk about uh, the Bible itself, but it was very similar. Um, so how do you just jump into that? And, and every person has his own story. This mm -hmm. is what makes it to me interesting in doing the Bible studies. Mm -hmm. So another story, I just, I tell too many stories, sorry about that. We had one fellow that a uh, young college student, very belligerent. Uh, he was an atheist and proud of it and didn't want to talk. So we finally, I just said, I'll tell you what, you came to learn about Jesus. Why don't we read what Jesus said? We turned to the Sermon on the Mount. And we didn't jump into it like John did last week on, on your uh, little talk here. We just had him read it mm -hmm. out loud. Mm -hmm. And he started reading and he got to about the third of the Beatitudes and he just looked up and he says, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. And it changed his whole attitude about who Jesus was. Reminded me, uh, was it Philip that told his brother, come and see, uh, rather than arguing, just come and see. Here's what Jesus said. Here's what mm -hmm. Jesus did. So those are the approaches that I've used. I don't know what's helpful out of all of this, but it's listen, listen, listen before you talk. I don't know if this is because uh, I interrupted you. We went off on a little tangent. But I, it's, the stories are great. You mentioned going to China. I've never been, but I've heard there's an English corner in most communities, which makes it easy to go up and talk. And maybe that's and you have to be careful who you talk to. But uh, we've been to Romania myself a few times, six or seven times, and it's easy as an American to stand, for me as an American to stand, I'm 6'2", good 220, I stand almost, it seems like a foot above your average Romanian, so it's no, I don't belong there, but I'm friendly, and I get along with people, and it's fun, and I remember they want to know how much money you make, and how much money falls off the trees in America, these are the questions you're getting and so it's not hard to get an audience or a conversation. I just quickly turned it into, I'm actually here to do a Bible study. Here's where we meet tonight. I'd have a flyer ready and either they would run or they would take interest. And that's the way I weeded out my audience. I wish that happened in America. That doesn't happen here. Nobody's knocking on the door. I don't stand out. I can't go to an English corner and say, hey, can I turn this into a Bible discussion? But there are things today that we have challenges. As you said, there's maybe more of an interest back in the day when you started in the 70s 
when you and I were together in the 90s to 2001, before 9-11, to me, that was a big, big marking point yeah. in my life. But here we are today about maybe what works. I would use a chart like you used. It just depends on the audience. They need to be grounded in what it says. I think that's helpful, but it depends on the audience. And how do you know that other than you listen, as you said, let me see where you are. I like to, hey, what do you think? Shut up and listen to that. And yeah. you're going to find out where they are if they're going to tell you. So. The fellow that converted me, Clyde, one time he was driving down uh, the road there in San Diego area somewhere. And here was one of the motorcycle gang guys, his motorcycle uh, parked there in the, the gutter and pile of oil underneath. And he'd blown up his motor right there. And so he just sat down on the curb waiting for his friends to come back with a pickup truck. So Clyde just parked his car and walked back, sat down next to him and began talking to him. Uh, basically ask him a question. What do you think about the church today? And the guy went off, told him that. <laughs> You're going to get an answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. And the interesting thing was almost everything that he had against the church today, you and I have against the organized church today. Yeah. And so Clyde said, you know, you're right about that. And then would point him to a particular scripture and quote it to him and ended up with a Bible study with the guy. Uh, so, yeah, where do you start? And the answer is where they are. And that, that, that's the hard part. Listen, Hugh, I'm going to give you two quotes that have stood out in my mind in my last 20 years of preaching that to me just resonate about just generally what the culture we live in. See if this resonates with you because there's exceptions to the rule. One quote from a young man, I don't have a problem with authority. Authority has a problem with me. In other words, I'm going to do what I want to do. Very clever, very witty. Okay, this guy's got a fun personality, but I can be witty right back. But that was an attitude he had, and he firmly believed in that. So that was his cute way to passive aggressively get around. I don't need to respect authority. It's just the other way around. So there's that problem. Number So I can do what I want. I don't need any. That's American dream, whatever. Number two. Jeff, I don't need you or anybody else to lecture me on my feelings. In other words, my feelings are superior to what the scriptures might think. I feel this is right. Can we look at what the scriptures say? Your little chart there, what's in scripture, what's opinion? It's blurred because I think kids are taught today, as long as you have a feeling Absolutely. accurate, it's valid, and we need to validate other people's feelings after all. How dare you lecture me about my feelings about this? So those two things to me, those two quotes I'll never forget. They resonate with me about, okay, how do I tackle this now? It takes a lot of humility and the lack of pride, and that's a whole other issue. But speak to that. Do you think, uh, am I onto something there as far as generally what we're up against? Yeah, I mentioned to you the other day when we were talking, uh, a new book that I just read that I thought capsulized a lot of this. Um, for example, let me throw another screen up here. Are you going to quote the book or are you just going to tease us with it? Is it Natasha uh, Green? Is that right? No, I, I quote the book. Fact Sorry, I'll okay. <laughs> show it to you. Can't uh, see it. Anymore. Show it to us. Oh, when you get, that's okay. Hang on. Yep. Faithfully different. Okay. Uh, Natasha Crane. I'm not trying to sell books, but what she pointed out in that uh, was that we're living in a totally different age, that what I did in the 70s doesn't work very much anymore. And her point was, we've started back when I did this in the 70s, most everybody had a biblical worldview. And today, we don't have a biblical worldview in America. Uh, almost all of America has shifted, and now we have a secular worldview. And that is shown, for example, just throwing up some statistics from uh, Barna, uh, the poll people, that back uh, in 2000, even, 77% of Americans self-identified as being Christians. Now, I have no idea what they meant by that, but that's they self-identified it. Today, it's down to 65%, just self-identifying. 
So Barnard decided they needed to ask some different questions. And they asked uh, about a biblical worldview. Absolute moral truth exists. The Bible is totally accurate. Satan is real. Uh, a person cannot earn their way into heaven. Jesus lived a sinless life. God is the all-knowing, all-powerful. And they use those uh, questions for their biblical worldview. Now, you and I would add a whole pile of more to that, um, but they tried to simplify that. The interesting thing was when they did and used those as their criterion, they found that only 17% of those that considered faith is important in their life and they attended church regularly, only 17% would even agree with those basics, let alone more than that. And so our young people are growing up and they are taught that your reality, your truth is the truth for you. I always laugh and just ask the question, is that true? Uh, there's no universal truth. Is that true? Uh, and, but that's what we're stuck with. So what we need to work on, and maybe the next guys that follow me, because I don't have the answers on this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you really begin approaching when they don't need anything besides their own opinion and their own feelings? What helps me is Ecclesiastes 3.11, is it? Where we have eternity in our hearts. I have to believe that. Whether yeah. they want to deny it or not, they have to believe that. And there may come a time in your life where you've put a pebble in their shoe and they may come back 20 years later yes. when it's crunch time. Okay, Jeff is approachable and reasonable, and I do pray to be that person. Let me go to somebody who's going to give me the straight answers here. And when you tell a throw a percentage up like that, only 17% show that kind of a deep interest. That means there's a lot of people out there that just don't know the Bible. Oh, it is sad. So the, the, the value, the benefit we have, Hugh, as instruments of God here is to say, as you said before, let's take a simple approach and can we read the Sermon on the Mount together? Let's see how this might knock your socks off as far as a worldview, as far as a right way of living. Yeah. See what that thinks. That's what works with me. Let me just read the script and that's, that's, the, that's what Paul was not ashamed of as he's getting persecuted going place to place. I'm going to keep giving it to the people who need to know this. So. And a simple question is, have you really ever read the Bible? Have you honestly, you have a lot of opinions about it. I point that out. You have a lot of strong opinions about it. What, what do you think about Matthew 5? What, I, you know, I don't know the scripture. Well, then how in the world can you have a strong opinion about this? I mean, I've actually had to say that. Just uh, yeah. how do you know? You see the arrogance. Uh, it's just, anyway, um, simple Sermon on the Mount, simple approach. I think that's the answer here. And the more people turn away, the less baggage they have of people who've never read the scriptures. And yeah. so maybe that's a calling card we have. I think so. Uh, a lot of times what I've started doing lately, if they've never done that, is just start reading through the book of Mark. And I'm going to tell you, by the time you've read three chapters in the book of Mark, you've had some really interesting discussions on who Jesus really is. Mm -hmm. And they then have to begin making some choices on that. Mm -hmm sometimes exactly sometimes a choice has to be this and i think we have to strategically point this out if you're not a christian what's your worldview of christians you've got the religious right you've got nationalism that's tied to patriotism you got a lot of stuff and okay uh, 10 15 years ago was the da vinci code i remember i had some good family members saying hey how can you defend the da vinci code and i don't you and i as an atheist and as a what I think is a conservative Christian, I'm with you in the condemnation of the Da Vinci Code and the violations of the Roman Catholic Church there. And just because I'm against abortion does not mean I line up with the Westboro Baptist Church. And uh, I've got to make that clear to sometimes because that's their view. That's the worldview they want to hate. They want to use us as an excuse. And you talk about throwing a pebble in somebody's shoe. You talk about, hey, I, I, I abhor what the Westboro Baptist Church does. And I'm a Christian. How, how can you, that doesn't compute, no think. I was getting that in Portland, Oregon all the time, you can imagine. They yeah. just thought it was one and the same. They're not the same. But if you're honestly looking for the truth, that's going to interest you. 
and you're going to willing to engage. And if they're not, what does Jesus say? I need to move on to somebody who might have an audience there. But sometimes that's our struggle, right? To, to dispel the misconceptions that are out there. And it's hard to do. Uh, outside of just saying, come and see. And Correct. Sit down and, Correct. And talk with them. We, one of the, the challenges that I like to make when I, again, it's not just in China, but I found a, a lot of the young people, the fellow that you were talking with, my feelings are the only criterion. And the question then that Greg Kukul in his book Tactics would have said was, why do you believe that? to get them to come back to foundational principles of their worldview. Why do you believe that? And it's interesting how many people that I've asked that question to that don't have an answer. That's just what I believe. Mm -hmm. But when we begin talking about worldviews, we're really talking about something that is a description of our whole reality, how we see the world. And it has to be able to have a foundation. Um, so I've, I've been finding myself talking more and more. I don't try to use the word worldview or that, but just uh, where does that fit? Is, is that true for everybody? Uh, I love the discussion. I'm going to give you a couple things here. One is you said, why do you think that? I can tell you very clearly why some people might favor gay marriage when they didn't before or transgender issues when they didn't before, because if they are against those intellectually, they understand their own situation. If I condemn gay marriage, now I've got to condemn me shacking up or being married for the 14th time or whatever it is. And so right. I want to just say everything goes. That might be the answer. Now you're into a deeper problem. Number two, when you say come and see, I like that, but come and see what? If you don't mind, I'm going to suggest we're not saying come and see what the local church does. That may be a good way, but come and see what the words of Jesus are. Right. Because if right. we just say simply come to church and, okay, where's the production? Where's the show? Where's the smoke and mirrors? Where's the band? They're going to be let down. But if they have a heart for God and f I want to be obedient to the Lord because I'm humble, they're going to worship God on his terms. But I think it takes a step to get there just versus coming it, and listening. It does. And, you know, for me, and this sounds funny because I encourage other people, if you can do nothing else, invite your friends to come with you to church. That's right. But I've never invited people to come to church. Right. I've invited them to sit down with me and study. Exactly. Uh, but exactly. then I'm in a different place than a lot of uh, people are right. concerning that. But I'm with you on that, that uh, if they come to church, the best thing to do is to call them up Sunday night and say, what did you think? Did you have questions? Was there anything that you saw that was odd? Uh, and, and to follow up, because if you get them to come to church, all you've done is that is a opening of the door to have a Bible study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, come and see, come and see what Jesus actually said. Come and see what he said. Um, and if you have things in place like home studies and so forth going on, it's just easy to just to say, come and see Tuesday night at a home study, this type of thing, yeah. or let's meet for lunch, that type of thing. You got to plan for it and be proactive about it, in my opinion. So. And it was like that guy I said that kept telling people, we're studying Genesis, why don't you come and, and join that? If you already have a Bible study going, just to, you know, two or three of you get together just reading through the scripture. Mm -hmm. so that you can invite somebody to come and join you as you're doing that. Now it's not confrontational. Right. You haven't said, sit down, I'm going to teach you something. Right. But you just open the door to sharing your learning and reading of the scripture together. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, it's much easier to get them to do that than, you know, confrontation about I'm going to prove you wrong. Right. Right, exactly. Very good. I just want to encourage you to look at the Facebook comments. We have some people saying hello from one in Tanzania, Africa, one from Uganda, one from uh, Kenya, among places in the States. So somehow a lot of people are interested in these type of conversations. We have several 
I say a few dozen, maybe close to a hundred right now listening in on this. And that's exciting. There's an interest in these yeah. topics. And I think sometimes we overlook that. And it's just good to have a conversation about these things to be the catalyst. I would argue you take a lesson like what Hugh's done, the pyramid scheme or the, I call it a, sorry, pyramid scheme. Yeah. Let me reword that, a pyramid <laughs> approach. Let me put it that way. Thank you. And the charts and the things we've discussed about just tactics, but you need to personalize it yourself. Take what we've talked about in this lesson and in this series with the other men and the men to come and personalize your own lesson and search your own story if you can, if you have to, but just personalize it and think of ways and pray, but don't forget to pray about it. Ways to sharpen your skills of bringing the gospel to others. We all see the need. We're just trying to better the way we go about it. So I don't want to cut you off too much. Do you have anything else or you've done a good job? No, with? I just apologize. I didn't have one lesson to share with you. Well, that's, uh, <laughs> but I've never, <laughs> I've never had one lesson to share. I've always just exactly. start where they are. No, this adds to this discussion, I think, very well. And I thank you for coming here and making time for us and contributing to this wonderful series. I'm ex I love the series. It's just great for me to set this up yep. and talk to other guys and some guys with you and your experience. Oh, by the way, you're going to talk about where do you think we're going? I'll let you answer that question. You talked about the past. You talked about now. Okay, where are we going, Mr. Prophet? Very, very, very quickly. Yeah, We've become a, a secular country where the only authority in people's lives is their self. Yeah. And the problem with self is that that's just for you and it doesn't work for society. That leaves society with only one thing and that's power. And who has the most power? Mm -hmm. And unfortunately right now, a lot of the power is seen in the social uh, agendas that we have. Yeah. So where are we going? The answer is not back towards God. Mm -hmm. So my biggest problem is Jeff, we we always look for some big movement to change the whole society. And you and I both know we're not the people to do that. Right. But I, I could change one or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where we need to get back to. Make sure that we are the lights of the world. Make sure that we are the salt of the earth and influence those that are around about us. Right. Uh, that's all that we can do. I'll give my little quick prediction of things. And I, I think it's just going to get worse. Easy. It's just going to get harder. Doesn't mean we, it's, and it's not impossible. It's just going to be different. And I think a little harder to me, 9-11 was a benchmark. I mentioned that earlier because that was a, uh, things are different. And with that, coupled with the school shootings, coupled with, you know, war on terror and a lot of things that have just gone on, you know, kids growing up today, they grew up, they were born after 9-11. And you and I remember a different world before that, but what they are bombarded with, including all those things I mentioned, those negative headlines. But what, you know, when I was 16, I could not wait to get my driver's license and go out and go drive. And just a trend, kids don't want to do that now. They're afraid to go out. Part of it is all the things I listed before. And I've looked at a study that kind of shows this is look at the way they get their news. You and I used to turn the news on at five o'clock, 10 o'clock. That's it. Today it's on their screens, bombarding them like, a, like snowballs. And they're just getting negative, 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 negative. Right. And I think they're getting a warped view of reality because a lot of people are pretty good. There's a lot of bad things out there, but I need to drag my kids out of the house sometimes and say, look at the people I meet every day at the supermarket who are different than me, who yep. vote differently than me, but we can still get along. We don't hate each other because there's differences there. That's reality, but that's not the headlines. That's not social media. And that's how they're getting this warped view of reality. Yeah. I mean, I live in a town of 100,000 people out here in West Texas, and everybody is friendly. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is we need to go back and develop the ability to have a conversation, mm -hmm. have a conversation with somebody that doesn't agree with me yeah. without yelling and screaming and turning it into a, a fight and that have a, have a conversation. Um, so where are we going? I don't know where the rest of the world's going. I'm just trying to influence as many people in the community where I live. I often, thank you. I often pray for me to myself to be effective among my sphere of influence of people. Yes. I with. And that's, you're right. I'm not going to revolutionize the world, uh, but I can do it in my own little world in my own way. And of all of yeah. us can do that from that. And so very good. Anything else to you, or is that uh, kind of wrap it up? That was or? more than what I knew. More than what you, well, we, we educated you good. That you educated yes. us. Thank you, Hugh, for sharing your experience. It's been great. Appreciate you doing this, Jeff. As always, appreciate it. Okay, brother. Everybody have a good day. It's been great.
we'll see you later. Bye.